Now we'll examine the behavior of a freely moving charge specifically in a uniform magnetic field. Turns out, it's pretty simple. There's only three possible motions we can have. We could have the particle start out moving parallel to the magnetic field like this, or the particle could start out moving perpendicular to the magnetic field like this, or neither, meaning it has some velocity component that's parallel to the B field and another that's perpendicular. These are the only three possibilities, parallel, perpendicular, or neither, which would be the general case. We should mention, however, that a charge that's not in motion doesn't experience any magnetic force, no matter how strong the magnetic field is. Only moving charges can feel such a force. So let's look at the first possibility. The charge's velocity is parallel to the magnetic field. Here again, because the magnitude of the force is qvb sine theta, and theta, the angle between v and b, is zero, since the two vectors are in the same direction, we end up with the force being zero. And that's pretty much all there is to it. If the velocity is parallel, or anti-parallel to the magnetic field, the force is zero, so the particle just continues in the same direction at the same velocity forever. Well, that was easy. That was easy. So let's try the second scenario. Imagine you have a charged particle with a velocity that's perpendicular to the uniform magnetic field. What does the motion look like now? Well, we remember our expression for the magnetic force on a moving charge is Q times V cross B. Assuming the charge is positive, remember the force is just the opposite direction if the charge is negative, but assuming it's positive, we need the direction of the force first. So because we have a cross product, we use the right hand rule. Pointing our fingers in the direction of V and curling our fingers in the direction of B will have our extended thumb point in the direction of the force. The cross product means the force is always going to be perpendicular to the velocity vector and the magnetic field vector. That's how cross products work. If you take A cross B, it must be perpendicular to both A and B in three dimensions. So our force here is perpendicular to the velocity, and it has to continue to be perpendicular to the velocity by the definition of the cross product. So when the velocity changes just a little bit as a result of the force, the force rebalances itself so it always stays perpendicular to the velocity. Just use the right hand rule if you don't believe me. When have we seen a situation like this before, where the force always stays perpendicular to the velocity of an otherwise free particle? Uniform circular motion. We have motion that looks like this. It's actually a perfect circle. We call this centripetal motion, or center seeking motion. In physics 1, there were a few equations we ended up with that described for us how centripetal motion works. We don't have to rederive them here or anything like that. Rather, we're just going to make use of exactly the same equations in this new context. We remember when we have uniform circular motion, we can write the magnitude of the net centripetal, or center seeking force, as mv squared over r, where m is the mass of the particle, v is the speed, and r is the radius of the circle the particle is moving in. Well here, the centripetal force is the magnetic force. They are one and the same, since the magnetic force is the only force acting on this particle, assuming we can ignore gravity on such a tiny charge. Then we can set the magnitude of the centripetal force equal to the magnitude of the magnetic force, which is QVB sine theta, where again theta is the angle between V and B. Here, because our original assumption was that the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and it always stays perpendicular to the magnetic field, theta is just pi over 2 radians, or 90 degrees, meaning sine theta is 1. So our equation of motion ends up being QVB equals MV squared over R. We can conveniently cancel out one of the V's and we're left with QB equals MV over R. An interesting equation, we have the charge, the magnetic field, the mass, its speed, and the radius of the circle of motion. Another tidbit you might remember from classical mechanics is if we have uniform circular motion, we can say the angular speed of the particle is its linear speed divided by the radius of the circle of motion, or omega is equal to V over R, which comes from the infamous V equals R omega equation. Then we have QB equals M times omega. Solving for omega, we end up with QB over M. Omega here is a famous number known as the angular cyclotron frequency. We'll have another video devoted exclusively to cyclotrons, but it's interesting how the angular speed of rotation omega only depends on the charge, mass of the particle, and strength of the magnetic field. 
If the same particle in the same magnetic field starts out with a larger velocity, it just sweeps out a larger radius, but at the same angular speed, which is pretty neat and not necessarily obvious from the start. So that takes care of our second possible motion. When the velocity starts out perpendicular to the magnetic field, the path it traces is perfect uniform circular motion. Our only other possibility is that the velocity is neither perpendicular nor parallel to the magnetic field. If that's the case, then this happens. Instead of tracing out a circle, the charge traces out a helix or a helical pattern. The way we quantify this is that even though the velocity isn't perpendicular to the magnetic field, it's always possible for us to resolve the velocity into a component that's perpendicular and a component that's parallel. If you don't believe me, just try it out. For any velocity vector you can imagine, we can always resolve that velocity vector into a parallel and perpendicular component. Then the magnetic force only acts to change the perpendicular component of velocity. The parallel component of velocity won't change because if you take the cross product of two vectors that are parallel, you just end up with zero. This is just a general property of cross products, but we could also see this by taking the sine of theta, where theta is zero degrees since they're parallel. So our previous equations in the circle case work just as well, provided we're only referring to the perpendicular component of the velocity. The perpendicular component of velocity follows uniform circular motion because only the perpendicular component is affected by the magnetic force. All the while the parallel component of velocity is left unchanged. Isn't that neat? Let's watch the charge move one more time, this time so we can see both components together. Also, aren't we lucky that we can see all this in three dimensions? Imagine trying to draw all this out on paper. Now, whether we're in the helix case or the circular case, the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the velocity by the definition of the cross product. Therefore, because the force is always perpendicular to the velocity, all the force can do is change the direction of the velocity. It's impossible for it to change the magnitude of the velocity. That would require a component of the force that's parallel to the velocity. A force that's perpendicular to a particle's displacement does no work on the particle, which means the force by itself can't change the particle's kinetic energy. A magnetic force can't make a particle speed up or slow down. All it can do is change a particle's direction of motion. Therefore, magnetic fields never do any work on charged particles. It's impossible for the magnetic force to do work on a particle because the force is always perpendicular to the velocity and, by extension, the resultant displacements. So in summary, a uniform magnetic field results in centripetal motion if a charged particle has a perpendicular velocity to the field, and it results in constant velocity if the particle's velocity is parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field and it results in a helix, or helical motion, if the charged particle has a velocity that's neither perpendicular nor parallel to the magnetic field. And that's all there is to it. Er, just one last point to make. Because we have the awesome benefit of being able to see everything in three dimensions, we could always easily tell what direction the magnetic field was pointing in, but that's not so easy with just pen and paper. So usually the way we draw it out on paper is if we have the magnetic field coming out of the screen or out of the page, then we use dots to symbolize that. If we have the magnetic field going into the screen or into the page, then we have little crosses to symbolize that for us. Where the symbolism comes from is if we imagine an arrow like from a bow and arrow, then the back of the arrow has something like a cross on it. So if we see a cross, the arrow looks like it's going into the screen or into the page. If the arrow is coming towards us, then it's like we see the pointy tip of the arrow, so it's just a dot coming straight out of the screen or out of the page. 